Good evening and welcome to the third week of the Molecular Epidemiology course. And today we're focusing on molecular techniques. A lot of the techniques we're going to cover hopefully are reviews of techniques you've already learned about, either in a molecular diagnostics course, um, in an undergraduate program, a molecular biology course. Some of these are covered in some biology courses, as well as possibly graduate level molecular biology courses. So we're just covering, you know, of course, not every single solitary molecular technique. We're just covering a few that are more commonly used in molecular epidemiologic studies. And as we review some studies later in this course and read some papers, we just want to make sure everyone has background knowledge in you know, general epidemiology as well as some of the molecular technologies. So of course, molecular techniques focus on those that involve nucleic acids. And our nucleic acids are DNA and RNA. So typically, the molecular techniques are DNA-based methods that can, you can use in any type of study. So molecular techniques are done in um, all sorts of biological, microbiological, um, molecular studies. Um, most research is done nowadays using molecular techniques. And a lot of clinical um, assays in the laboratory, diagnostic assays, are now moving to molecular techniques. So molecular has become more and more common over the years. It's important to remember that portions of the DNA in your genome are going to vary slightly. So the majority of our DNA sequences are identical, but there are regions that vary from individual to individual. And so a lot of times those are the regions we're going to focus on in molecular studies because that's going to allow us to look at those variations that might exist and may be associated with specific diseases. So one thing we're going to talk about in more detail a little later on is you know, DNA typing. So one-tenth a single percent of DNA differs from one person to the next. So although that's a very small amount, it still amounts to about 3 million bases. If you remember in molecular biology, your bases are your nucleotides, your G, A, T, and C. Um, and so those are going to differ slightly from one person to the next. And how we type DNA is we're going to look at those regions that are different to see if we can identify differences from one individual to another individual. These regions that differ are termed variable regions. And you can look at those variable regions to identify a profile, a DNA profile, which is also known as a DNA fingerprint. And you can obtain DNA from samples such as blood, bone, hair, body tissues. Um, there are many different uh, samples you can use to obtain usable DNA. You just have to keep in mind that in order to get usable DNA, you need to have cells with a nucleus. So if you have whole blood, you would not use red blood cells because they don't have mature red blood cells, don't have a nucleus. You would use the white blood cells in the blood, which are nucleated, and that's where your DNA will um, be obtained. So DNA techniques, you are going to have to obtain DNA from whatever sample you may have at your disposable, disposal. So that could be, like we said, whole blood. It could be a piece of tissue. Um, 
And so the first thing you're going to want to typically do is extract your DNA from whatever sample you have. Once you have nice, pure, clean DNA, you can then utilize that DNA for many different types of techniques. So DNA typing, where again, we're going to talk about a little bit later in this lecture in more detail, but typically what you're doing is you're looking at specific regions, usually those variable regions in the genome. You could look at those regions by making small pieces of DNA that correspond to the sequence that you are looking at, and these would be called probes. And when you hybridize your probe with your DNA, it will stick or hybridize, same thing, sticking and hybridizing, to the complementary area of the DNA. So once that DNA hybridizes or sticks to that area of the DNA, you can then look and see where that probe is sticking to. So for example, if you have a specific sequence you're interested in and you added a probe to a, a large piece of DNA, you can then look and see how many bands you have to see how many times that probe hybridized, meaning there was a complementary sequence that many times in that particular region of DNA. And depending on how many bands you have and the location of those bands, that would be considered a DNA fingerprint. And sometimes those banding patterns are unique from individual to individual. So that's how you can get your fingerprinting or DNA typing um, based on this technique. And you can identify differences from one individual to another individual. Now a common, a super common technique that we use in molecular um, laboratories is amplification. And basically amplification is amplifying a specific region of DNA. And one of the most common ways to amplify DNA is using polymerase chain reaction or PCR. So like we said, PCR is a method to amplify and make millions of copies of a particular sequence of DNA, a particular area of DNA. So you can have a small amount of DNA that you've obtained, you've extracted from a sample, for example. You can then amplify one region of it and make millions of copies so that you can utilize those millions of copies to do, to do many different types of analyses. There are many different types of PCR reactions. So you can have your basic polymerase chain reaction. You can, if you start off with uh, extract RNA, you can convert that RNA through the enzyme called reverse transcriptase into complementary DNA. And then you can continue with your complementary DNA doing basic PCR that is called reverse transcription PCR. There's also real-time PCR where you're amplifying a region, typically, again, starting with RNA, and you're amplifying region, a region using fluorescence in real time. So you can actually look to see what's being amplified as it's being amplified. There are, there's PCR-mediated site-directed mutagenesis. There's a random amplified polymorphic DNA. There's allelic-specific PCR. There's nested PCR. There's multiplex PCR. So there's many, many different variations of the basic PCR amplification. So PCR is really one of the primary molecular techniques used.
So hopefully you've all had BC PCR in a general biology class or a molecular class. So with PCR, you have a region of DNA. Your DNA, as you already know, is double-stranded. So you want to heat that DNA up to a high enough temperature where you separate the double strands into two single strands. That's called denaturation. You then have small little pieces of DNA called uh, what we call oligos or primers. Those are going to hybridize to the complementary areas of the single-stranded DNA, and they are going to that that binding to the complementary uh, regions is called annealing. We then take our polymerase, an enzyme that is going to add complementary nucleotides across that single strand of DNA to make a complementary copy of that original DNA strand. So that's how the DNA is copied and making multiple strands. So these steps, denaturation, annealing, and elongation, are done over and over and over again. So basically you're taking double-stranded DNA, you're heating it to 95 degrees to separate, you're then lowering the temperature down to an appropriate temperature, usually around you know, 60 degrees, it varies, but depending on your primers, your DNA sequence, that's gonna, lowering the temperature is going to allow your short little primer to stick or anneal or hybridize to the complement complementary sequence. And then you're going to raise the temperature up to 72 degrees for that polymerase to come in and elongate or make a complementary other strand of DNA. So the components you need for PCR, you need what's called a thermal cycler to get your temperatures in the right sequence to happen over and over and over again. PCR commonly is done in cycles of 30, although you can do different numbers of cycles. The components you have to have in your reaction are your polymerase, which is going to elongate, add your nucleotides. You need your nucleotides or your DNTPs all of this has to happen in a buffer, and your buffer liquid typically has tris and several salts in it, like magnesium chloride. Of course, you need your primers, a forward primer or a reverse primer. Again, primers are also called oligos or oligonucleotides, and they are typically between 15 and 25 bases in length and your original or target DNA sequence. And so here's a schematic where you have your original sequence of DNA. It's been denatured, so you have a single strand. Your short little primer is going to come on and hybridize to the complementary strand, and then your polymerase is going to add your nucleotides in complementary bases along that strand to make a complementary other strand for your double-stranded DNA. Again, your cycle is first denaturation, followed by annealing, followed by your extension or elongation, and that happens over and over and over and over again for typically around 30 cycles. And so another schematic where you show your double strand goes to single strands, your forward and reverse primers anneal to each strand, your polymerase copies that strand on the other side, makes two identical pieces of double-stranded DNA. Those two strands then denature or separate. You get your um, annealing again, you get your elongation, and from those two strands, you're gonna end up with four strands. Those four strands then denature, and that same process happens over and over and over again. So you're doubling, those uh, numbers ev with every single cycle. 
So the advantages of PCR is that it's very fast. You can do a typical PCR reaction. You have your reagents, your original DNA. If you have the correct primers, you can have a PCR uh, result within two hours, depending on how large the, DN the piece of DNA is, how many cycles you need to run, with the different temperatures that you have to reach at each of the different cycles, but it can be anywhere from two to five hours, so relatively quickly. Very, very tiny amounts of nucleic acid can be amplified to millions of copies, so that could be very beneficial if you need, if you're doing a technique that needs a larger amount of nucleic acid. It can be super highly sensitive as well as specific. Um, you know, there are many, many different usages of PCR. You can identify if you have a particular region or a gene uh, uh, present in a piece of, of DNA. You can look to see if you have certain types of mutations. So there's a lot of different things um, you can do with PCR. Disadvantages, uh, and this is a disadvantage of several of the molecular techniques, is because in this instance you're multiplying multiple copies, you don't want to have any type of DNA contamination. If your sample is contaminated, you could be amplifying a contaminant and not what you actually want to be amplifying, so that could give you false amplification or false positive re results. Sometimes your amplification is not 100% specific, so you have to be really careful with primer design and the assay design and the temperatures you're using. So usually you're going to want to do uh, some testing beforehand to make sure everything is running um, as ideal as possible before you actually start performing your amplifications. Uh, specificity is dependent on the temperatures that you use as well as the magnesium concentration. So again, you're going to want to make sure you do some analyses beforehand to get the correct temperatures and all the correct concentrations to get optimal results. And to analyze your PCR, a lot of times you'll do PCR and then you will have to make a gel and run a gel, do agarose gel electrophoresis. And so the running of the gel could also take a couple of hours. So analyzing your PCR product could take just as long as you, your actual PCR reaction. And that's where sometimes real-time PCR is preferred because you get the results in real time as they're happening. You don't do the re PCR reaction first, then run it on a gel, and then get your results. But it really depends on what type of analyses you're doing, um, you know, based on which type of amplification reaction you're going to use. So we mentioned sometimes in PCR, you actually run the PCR, and then you're going to do gel electrophoresis. Hopefully all of you have had agarose gel electrophoresis covered in a previous course. So as you know, your agarose is a, uh, you know, kind of a semi-solid uh, surface that you're going to run your DNA through. It starts out very much like agar in a microbiology agar plate. It's, you could start out as a liquid when it's heated up and due to a seaweed compound, when it cools down to room temperature, it hardens. So you get this kind of jelly, um, jello-y type of um, compound at the end once it's hardened. So when you perform electrophoresis, you move your DNA from a negative charge to a positive charge. So you're ba basically separating out your DNA molecules based on charges. So in order to do electrophoresis, you use an electrophoresis chamber. You have to have a voltage power supply to um, move voltage through the gel to get your 
fragments, your pieces of DNA to move through the gel based on charge. You need to make your gel using a casting tray. You need combs to make the well of the gel. This all has to be run in a buffer, which is typically uh, TAE or TBE. You have to load your DNA into the well. And um, once You have to load your DNA into the um, wells. And what you usually do there is you use a loading buffer. The loading buffer has glycerol in it to pull the DNA into the well. And it also has a dye so you can actually see the DNA. You are going to have to visualize your DNA. So how you do that is you use a typically a dye called ethidium bromide, which is going to fluoresce when it's under a, uh, UV, a UV light. So you also need a UV light source, such as a transilluminator, so that you can put your gel on it and put the UV light on and then see where your DNA is based on where that ethidium bromide lights up. Again, we, we said that the DNA migrates through the gel from a negative charge to a positive charge, and the, the DNA fragments are going to move through the gel based on their size. So slower, uh, larger pieces of DNA are going to move through slow, more slowly Small pieces of DNA are going to move through the gel much more quickly. So you can determine what size your DNA fragments are based on how far they move through the gel. And so this is just a schematic showing the difference between how DNA moves through a point 7% agarose gel, a 1% agarose gel, and a 1.5% agarose gel. So you can make your agarose concentrations as concentrated or less con concentrated as you need based on the size of the DNA you are looking for. So if you're expecting a very large fragment of DNA, you're going to want to lower your concentration of agarose so that the large fragments can move through it more easily and separate out better. If you have really tiny pieces of DNA that you're expecting, you're going to want to use a, a higher concentration of agarose so that you can see better separation of the smaller fragments. We already mentioned ethidium bromide. It intercalates between the bases of the nucleic acid and it will fluoresce under UV light. So when you put the ethidium bromide in your gel and then you run your DNA through it, Wherever you have your DNA, the ethidium bromide is going to stick to it. And when you get under that UV light, it is going to fluoresce. So you can see the nice, bright DNA bands. Now, another key um, enzyme, really, we talked about polymerase with amplification, PCR. But another enzyme that's very important in molecular techniques is restriction endonucleases. And when we use restriction endonucleases, or what we call restriction enzymes, what we are doing is what the term is digesting DNA. So basically what restriction enzymes do is they are very short, um, it's basically, you can uh, refer to a restriction enzyme as a pair of scissors. What it does is it cuts DNA. But how it cuts DNA is differs from one enzyme to another. So what usually restriction enzymes do is it's, think of them as a pair of scissors that recognize a very specific sequence. And it's going to snip each strand of the DNA between two nucleotide bases when it recognizes that specific sequence. 
So for example, one restriction enzyme is going to recognize the sequence GGATTC and it is going to snip between the two Gs, GG, whenever it sees the sequence GGATTC. So restriction enzyme is going to come down and read your nucleotides, and whenever it says sees GGATTC, it snips between the two Gs. So it'll keep doing that, keep reading down the DNA, and again, if it says sees GGATTC, it's going to snip between the two Gs. Each restriction enzyme recognizes a different small piece of, of DNA at a specific nucleus, nucleotide sequence. A completely different restriction enzyme recognizes the sequence um, GATCCT, for example. I mean, there's all different, there's hundreds of different restriction enzymes, might even be more than that. So depending on what sequence you'd be looking for in your piece of DNA, you would use that particular restriction enzyme to snip your DNA whenever it saw that particular sequence. So for example, here you have double-stranded DNA. It's separated into the single strands where you can see the complementary bases. Here we have the enzyme ECOR1, and it's going to snip your each strand of your DNA between those whatever two nucleotides that it recognizes, and it's going to result in cutting out a small region of your DNA. And this is considered making sticky ends, this particular one, because you can see the way it cuts, it's leaving an overhang there. What this allows you to do is for example, you can stick a completely foreign gene in here and make a restriction, um, P, uh, re, uh, restrict, a uh, restriction, P, sorry. <laughs> oh, you can uh, make a recombinant, sorry, not restriction, a recombinant piece of DNA where you're, re, you're combining one gene from one cell or one organism, for example, with another piece of DNA. So it's one use for restriction enzymes. You can also use restriction enzymes to see if maybe you have a mutation, which is very commonly done in fingerprinting, where you'll have a, for example, a DNA sequence that might be a gene, for example. And if you have a mutation present, so one of your nucleotides isn't what it should be, that might actually generate a restriction enzyme. So for example, if you have G, 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 A, T, T, C, and that second G is really supposed to be a C, but it became a G because of the mutation, you then generated a restriction enzyme cut site. So if you add that restriction enzyme to that piece of DNA, it's going to cut there where normally it wouldn't if there's no mutation. So if you cut it, you're going to get a different banding pattern because now you have a snip, a small piece of DNA. So you're going to be able to see that there was a mutation there because you got an extra little piece of DNA or a little band. It can also remove a restriction site. So so in the opposite case, where you would normally have a G and that would make that particular restriction sequence and you remove that G and it's mutated to an A, it's going to remove that cut site. So if you add that particular enzyme, it's not going to cut the DNA any longer. And so you can see those changes when you run that digested DNA on a gel. You can also use blotting techniques such as a southern blot, a northern blot, or a western blot. Southern blots use DNA. We cut our genomic DNA with restriction enzymes. We then 
have a probe where it's a labeled piece of DNA. Let's say we're looking for a particular sequence. We make a small probe of nucleotides. It's labeled with, for example, like a fluorescent uh, label on it. You'd add that probe to your, your cut DNA and wherever it sits, you're gonna be able to see that probe. Northern blot is the same process, but instead of DNA, you're using RNA. And Western blot, you're actually looking at proteins. So not DNA or RNA there. So for blotting, typically you're going to do some sort of electrophoresis. You're then going to transfer your, your electrophoresis reaction onto a membrane, a solid support. You then block your membrane to remove any, um, block up any areas that don't have nucleic acid on it. You're then going to add your probe and allow it to hybridize to comp complementary regions. You're then going to wash excess probe off, and then you're going to add whatever detection method to be able to see where your bands hybridize, where they light up. So for your transfer, you know, this transfer happens whether you're using DNA, RNA, or protein, you're going to run them on some sort of gel for southern blotting, it's going to be an agarose gel. For northern blotting, it's usually going to be a polyacrylamide gel. It, it depends on, on what your what type of product you're looking for. You're always going to transfer whatever it is, DNA, RNA, or proteins, to the membrane. You always want it on the membrane before you add your probe and allow your probe to hybridize. So your probe isn't going to hybridize to that jello-y um, gel. It's going to hybridize to that solid support membrane. And so that's why it's called blotting because you're transferring your nucleic acid from one type of comp compound to another, that solid support. So you're basically blotting the same nucleic acid from one to the other. So typically um, it could be a piece of nitrocellulose membrane that you're blotting to and then you're going to hybridize your probe and look at what bands you get. And you can do different types of labeling to your probes. You can look at it through radioactivity. You can do fluorescent probes and you look at look at it through fluorescence, which ones which where the bands fluoresce. You can do colorimetric too, or chemiluminescence. And here's just a schematic of a typical southern blot where you take your DNA, you cut it with restriction enzymes, you run it on agarose gel, you then transfer it to your nitrocellulose membrane, you're going to block all areas on that membrane that don't have any DNA, you're then going to add your probe, allow your probe to hybridize to complementary sequences, wash your probe off, and then detect and see where your bands are. Now, another very common method and has become much more common over the years as sequencing has gotten much faster and easier and less expensive. So sequencing is another commonly used technique. It's a great technique to look for differences in DNA in, DN, in different individuals DNA. So DNA sequences sequencing is allowing you to identify the exact nucleotide sequence of an area of DNA. So in order to really see and compare one person's DNA in one region to another person's you really would, you know, you can do a lot of these other techniques, you know, we've talked about blotting and, you know, re using restriction enzymes and doing agarose gel electrophoresis, but the gold standard really is actually looking at that nucleotide sequence and using sequencing.
there are different types of sequencing methods. You know, there's manual methods, there's you know, automated me methods. The more common method used now is next generation sequencing. The important thing here is no matter what type of method you happen to be using, that you know, with DNA sequencing, you are getting that nucleotide sequence. So typically, um, here's uh, a, a method that you know some sequencers use, where you uh, will get an electropherogram and you get different colored peaks based on which nucleotide you're seeing. So where the peak is and the color, you can determine the exact sequence. You know, G, A, T, C, T, G, G, um, based on your electropherogram. And so here's a typical you know, sequence readout, and it gives you not only the colored peaks, but it actually will give you the nucleotide sequence that corresponds to those colors. And you can compare one person's sequence to another person's sequence in the same region of DNA and see if one individual has a particular mutation that you might be looking for that may indicate a specific disease or you might want to be seeing if it's associated with a disease. So we talked about typing earlier, and again, that's also DNA typing is also called fingerprinting. So steps in producing a genetic fingerprint, you are going to have to obtain your DNA. We already you know, mentioned that you're extracting your DNA. You may need to amplify a specific region of DNA because typically if you just extract DNA, you don't really have enough DNA to do much with, so you might want to focus on one particular gene of DNA or one particular gene. So you're going to amplify that and get many, many copies of it. You're typically going to use a restriction enzyme or multiple restriction enzymes, depending on what you're looking for, to snip that uh, DNA at specific regions. You're typically going to use some sort of electrophoresis or blotting using probes or electrophoresis using your primers in order to see differences in you know, your banding patterns based on mutations is pretty typical. And so here's just a common um, DNA fingerprint. You have your markers, the lanes with the tons of bands. Those are, are commercial markers that show you exactly what size each of those bands are. So you can match up bands from your uh, analysis. In this case, it's a blot. And see what size those bands are compared to your markers. And so this is what we considered typical restriction fragment polymorphism, where you have your DNA and based on the different restriction cut sites and if they're there or if they're not there, you're going to have extra bands or let few, you know, more bands or fewer bands on um, your result. So we talked about this and you could have a mutation that either adds a restriction site or gets rid of a restriction site. So for example, you have this piece of DNA. This would you know, be a, a double-stranded DNA in a typical genomic DNA. And in A above, you have sequences GAA, TTC, and then you know, you've got a lot of other nucleotides in here, and then another GAA, TC, and then a bunch of nucleotides in between, and then another GAA, TC. So GAATC is going to be a restriction enzyme cut site. So it's going to recognize that sequence. In B, you have another person's DNA, the same region. But in this person's case, there is, instead of a C, there's a T. So it's actually going to change 
that restriction site. So the A piece, the A chromosome, is going to have two cuts, but the B will have one cut based on a loss of a restriction site. So you'll see fewer bands in B than you will in A. So B will have one, A will have two. So A is going to have two, B is going to have one, and when you combine A and B, you're going to have three. So this is just an example of how you can use restriction enzymes and see if you have mutations, which are going to add a restriction site or lose a restriction site, and you can compare a fingerprint or the number of bands between two different regions or two different individuals, for example. Another technique that's being used more are biochips or microarrays, where you have a collection of nucleic acids on a teeny, teeny, tiny surface, which is called a chip, which is very tiny. Um, so these are gene chips, DNA chips, microarrays, gene arrays. There's many different names for these. And the nice thing about these is you're collecting tons and tons and tons of regions of nucleic acid on this small chip. And then you are exposing that chip to something that you might be looking for. For example, you know, does a certain uh, environment or a certain chemical, what kind of changes do they cause in someone's um, you know, DNA or someone's protein, for example. So you can be having these tiny spots that represent someone's entire genomic uh, DNA on the chip. You expose the chip and then you look to see if which genes are upregulated and which ones are downregulated, which ones don't change at all, for example. So that's it's just an example of how you can use a microarray. So microarrays, you can look at um, messenger RNA or gene expression profiling. So again, you know, looking at the levels of many, many, many thousands of different genes and genomic DNA all at the same time. So instead of amplifying one gene using PCR and amplifying another and amplifying another and looking at all of them individual, Individually, a microarray lets you look at all of these different genes all at the same time. It allows you to do comparative genomic hybridization, hybridization so looking at large rearrangements in genomic DNA. It can allow you to look for single nucleotide polymorphisms or SNPs. Um, just, there's many different uh, things you can do with microarray techniques. We already mentioned you know, orderly arrangement of nucleic acids or proteins on a small chip. And so it's very similar to blotting technique, although instead of um, you know just having one lane with your genomic DNA all cut into little bits, you have it on a chip and all different spots all over the chip that can be um, an entire genomic sequence. And again, you're exposing that entire chip, the entire genomic regions to a specific stressor that you're looking for, for example, and then you're looking, you get a ton of data from just that one chip and looking at the different changes. So no matter what type of molecular technique you're using, you have to be very particular about the way you're collecting your sample. You have to be careful not to contaminate it. So we already mentioned contamination is a huge issue with amplification techniques such as PCR. Um, so no matter what type of molecular technique you're doing, you have to consider, you know, how are you collecting it? How are you amplifying, for example, DNA? How are you storing it? You know, you want to store your DNA so it doesn't degrade 
You want to store it typically in a freezer. If you store it too long at room temperature, it could degrade over time. You don't want to contaminate your samples, your nucleic acid samples. If you talk, um, you know, you're, you're expressing aerosols. The DNA can actually fall into your samples if you sneeze, things like that. So you typically want to handle nucleic acids in a really clean environment, usually in you know, a, a clean chamber or a class two biosafety cabinet, for example. Um, you know, you want to use clean gloves, you want to use barrier pipette tips, everything you can to reduce any risk of contamination. So we mentioned this wear gloves, um, you know, your disposable equipment like barrier tips and things like that. You know, nice clean pipette men. Don't touch any areas. Don't talk, sneeze, cough while you're performing some of these tasks. You just want to make think, sure make sure everything's really clean. So advantages of molecular techniques, very specific and sensitive. Um, you can detect really tiny changes. You can amplify a few copies of DNA or RNA into millions of copies. You can do you know, genotyping. You can look at really small, like one nucleotide mutations in a gene, for example. So very, very sensitive technique. Limitations, uh, typically higher costs than some of the other techniques. We talked about contamination as a limitation. Um, you know, sometimes you need dedicated space. So like I said, you, know, you need like a clean room for certain types of, of analyses. So you have to have the lab space to do it. You have to get the appropriate equipment. And it is considered a highly complex test, molecular testing. So we have to have appropriate personnel that can perform the higher complexity testing. So those are some of the key techniques that you'll find as we read some articles that involve molecular into epidemiologic studies. Hopefully all of these are a review for you. If you wanna go over anything in more detail, you, you can definitely reach out. So that is the end of the lecture. I will open it up for any questions. I didn't have any questions. That was great. Thank you. Oh, terrific. OK, thanks, Elizabeth, for coming. And if anyone else has any questions on any of these molecular techniques, or we have another lecture this week for week three on just a general overview of molecular biology, just you know, reach out any time. I have you know, other materials that you can read, and I'm happy to go over any of it with you in a telephone or a virtual meeting. So good luck with week three. We have a week three assignment where you um, will be looking at a an article that goes over some molecular epidemiology and again some um, you know some of the terms that you'll commonly see in a molecular epidemiologic study and several questions you're going to answer based on that article. So I will uh, see everybody in, throughout the week three and as we move into week four. So thanks everyone.